Hello, welcome to Focus Frostburg. I hope that you have um, been to several of the programs and seen a number of the recordings that have been posted for this week of Focus Frostburg. This is something that we've been doing for a number of years, um, trying to feature issues of environmental and social sustainability on Frostburg State University's campus and in the greater region and on the national um, level as well. So, so I am going to be talking to you today um, about my paper presentation from Cynic to Optimist, Envisioning a Positive Future. And I'll tell you right now that I decided not to do any bells and whistles. And so essentially it's just a recording of me talking to you about issues of concern. So if you want to turn off my picture and just listen to my words, that's fine. I will not be offended. So let me begin by just sharing a little bit about myself. I grew up on a farm in central Missouri, and I've always been somewhat aware of environmental issues. That monoculture farming that I was raised with, corn and soybeans, which required a whole lot of pesticides, it just never felt right to me. And even as a young teenager, I started to note and become very concerned about the number of cancer cases in my rural community. There was always a concern about well water, and a concern that those pesticides have been impacting our well water. And when I was growing up, everybody in the rural community was on a, a well. And there were incredible rates of cancer. After graduating from college, I moved to East Tennessee, where I found employment working in the visitor centers of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, hiking at every opportunity and working with incredible park rangers and naturalists raised my awareness of environmental issues. And by the time I was in my late 20s, I was living in a place where my bicycle was my primary source of transportation. And I was very much active on local community organizations committed to creating a greener, more sustainable future, particularly through the development of infrastructure that encouraged cycling, public transportation, and pedestrian travel. When I was teaching at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, I was the faculty advisor for a group that I helped create called the Better Asheville Recycling Coalition, which went to local businesses, restaurants, and bars for the most part, and encouraged them to recycle and really facilitated recycling efforts. And this was in the early 2000s, and, and very few of them had any recycling efforts at all at that point. And we made a big difference. As a faculty member at FSU, I became active in our Learning Green, Living Green initiative, and I collaborated with other like-minded individuals to encourage the university to adopt more environmentally sustainable practices. I was a member of the Association of the Advancement for Sustainability in Higher Education, and I attended and participated in several of that organization's inspiring conferences and workshops. For multiple years, I chaired the President's Advisory Council for Sustainability here at Frostburg State University. As a professor of sociology, I developed the course Sociology of the Environment, and I was an active member of the advisory committee for the university's minor in sustainability. I followed the news on climate change closely, and I've been an active participant in environmental campaigns, including movements to end mountaintop removal of coal mining and to prevent fracking from having a presence in Western Maryland. And while I wasn't often on the front lines of the protest, I did write letters, I met with senators and state representatives to voice my concerns, and I provided testimony at community listening sessions. I've also worked hard to create opportunities for dialogue on these issues on campus through the FSU Appalachian Festival and other venues. And somewhere along the line, I began to feel overwhelmed. Our environmental crisis seemed too big. I felt like the U.S. government wasn't moving quickly enough, industry was slow to adapt, and the Trump administration seemed to set all progress back a full decade and destroy any forward momentum we may have had. In my own engagement in environmental issues, I started to feel like I was simply going through the motions. I was feeling burnt out. What some psychologists have described as the cumulative process marked by emotional exhaustion and withdrawal associated with increased workload and institutional stress. But that workload that was causing that feeling was self-generated. 
the positive deliverables of my actions to create a more sustainable society had a similar success rate to those of Sisyphus. It didn't seem to matter how long I pushed and how far I pushed that boulder. Society wasn't shifting as quickly as I thought and continue to think it must. All the news was bad, and it appeared to be getting worse. And the books that I was reading were all sounding alarm bells. Toxic communities, losing the earth, the uninhabitable earth. Even among activists within academia, the discussion was shifting from what a mitigation, addressing climate change now in order to create a more positive, livable future, to one of resilience, how society might rebuild after what seemed more and more like the inevitable environmental apocalypse. My own son was focusing on worst case scenarios, reading up on survival manuals, and giving presentations on the environmental warning his audience and warning the audience that we were all going to die. He was nine years old. Now, as a 10 year old, his presentation for this year's Focus Frostburg exhibits many of the same themes. For years, environmental activists have warned of tipping points, painting a dark scenario for the planet's and of humanity's future. So for years, environmental activists have warned of tipping points, painting a dark scenario for the planet's and humanity's future. Are those images self-defeating though? Do they lead to burnout and the type of compassion fatigue that I was beginning to feel myself? I was clearly feeling that pressure until I picked up the book, The Future We Choose by Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnick. In that work, the co-authors, both of whom had been instrumental in advancing the Paris Climate Agreement, shift the discussion to focus on positive progress and achievable environmental goals. They don't argue that it's an easy task. The path to a positive and sustainable future remains arduous, but they contend that we'll never achieve it if we can't envision it. The doom and gloom talk, while important in jarring us from complacency, isn't enough. In fact, it may be counterproductive. It's easy to feel overwhelmed. Instead, they argue, we need to focus on the positive. We need to train ourselves to be optimists. We need to envision the reality of an environmentally and socially sustainable future. If we can't envision it, we can't achieve it. So how do we shift our thinking? How do we get from that position of doom and gloom to a position of optimism? Well, we change our mindset. First, we consider who we choose to be. It's that old trope that the longest journey begins with a single step, right? We can't personally change everyone's behavior, but we can change our own behavior. And the changes we make can and will inspire others. In sociology courses, I teach students about the sociological imagination. And that's the ability to understand the impact that social forces have on our everyday choices and behaviors. But it's also the ability to understand that those social forces don't come out of nowhere. Individuals collectively create and perpetuate those social forces, which means that individuals can collectively alter and change those social forces too. Figueres and Rivet Karnak write, quote, our current crisis requires a total shift in our thinking. To survive and thrive, we must understand ourselves to be intentionally connected to all of nature. We need to cultivate a deep and abiding sense of stewardship. This transformation begins with the individual. Who we are and how we show up in the world defines how we work with others, how we interact with our surroundings, and ultimately the future we create. I'm teaching sociology of the environment this semester. The authors of our primary textbook with lead author F. Mark Michael Bell argue that the development of a more ecological society requires four C's. Conceptions, we have to be able to dream it and understand that change is necessary. Connections, we have to understand our relationships to one another and recognize our common ground. We also have to recognize the common natural environment that we all share. 
contestation. Social change only occurs when individuals are willing to challenge the status quo. And construction. Together, we have to co-create the positive, ecologically oriented society that we've dared to dream. Figueres and Rivet Karnak echo those same sentiments, saying that to accomplish this, three mindsets are fundamental to that shift. Stubborn optimism, endless abundance, and radical regeneration. They write, when your mind tells you that it is too late to make a difference, Remember that every fraction of a degree of extra warming makes a big difference, and therefore any reduction in emission lessens the burden of the future. When your mind tells you that this is all too depressing to deal with and it is better to focus on things you can directly affect, remind yourself that mobilizing for big generational challenges can be thrilling and can imbue your life with meaning and connection. When your mind tells you that it will be impossible for the world to lighten its dependence on fossil fuels, remember that already more than 50% of the energy in the UK comes from clean power, that Costa Rica is 100% clean, and that California has a plan to get to 100%, including cars and trucks, by the time today's toddlers have finished college. When your mind tells you that the problem is the broken political system and we can't fix that, so there is no point in doing anything. Remind yourself that political systems are still responsive to the views of the people, and that throughout history, people have successfully overcome extraordinary odds to achieve political change. And when your mind tells you that you are just one person, too small to make a difference, so why bother? You can remind yourself that tipping points are nonlinear. We don't know what is going to make the difference. But we know that in the end, systems do shift and all the little actions add up to a new world. Every time you make an individual choice to be responsible, custodians of the beautiful earth, you contribute toward major transformations. And we'll look at some passages in their book again soon. Optimism is empowering. It's that theme of conception all over again. Optimism empowers you. It drives your desire to engage, to contribute, to make a difference. It makes you jump out of bed in the morning because you feel challenged and hopeful at the same time. It calls you to that which is emerging and makes you want to be an active part of change. Optimism is the force that enables you to create a new reality. Optimism is not the result of achieving a task that we have set for ourselves. That is the celebration. Optimism is the necessary input to meeting a challenge. Optimism is having steadfast confidence in our ability to solve big challenges. It's about making the choice to tenaciously work to make the current reality better. Optimism is about actively proving through every decision and every action that we are capable of designing a better future. And their next point, the next sentiment that they say is needed in that fundamental shift is endless abundance. We have to let go of the idea that one person's gain is another person's loss. Instead of competing with each other, Instead of allowing individualism to always be prioritized, we must look for ways to collaborate. It's that theme of connection that I mentioned earlier. And what does that connection look like? When we are motivated by a desire for collaboration, we liberate ourselves from the restrictive framing of attaining what I want or think I need and open ourselves up to a broader framing of what is available and possible in many other forms. Available to me, but not only to me, to others as well. 
The realization of abundance is not an illusory increase in physical resources, but rather an awareness of a broad array of ways to satisfy needs and wants so that everyone is content. In this way, resources will be protected and replenished and the relationships among us are enriched. That's endless abundance. We can also add creativity, solidarity, innovation, and many other abundant human attributes available to us endlessly. And the third mindset is this idea of radical regeneration. And with this theme, we revisit that idea of construction that we talked about in the sociology of the environment. A regenerative mindset is most effective if pursued intentionally and consistently. It is both a tough mental discipline and a gentleness of spirit that needs to be cultivated. It is about understanding that beyond getting what we want and need from our human fellow human beings, we have the responsibility to replenish ourselves and help others to restore themselves to levels of greater energy and insight. It's about understanding that beyond extracting and harvesting what we need from nature, it is our responsibility and in our enlightened self-interest to protect life on this planet. Indeed, even enhance the planet's life-giving capacity. Personal and environmental goals are interlinked, mutually reinforcing, and they both need our attention. A regenerative mindset bridges the gap between how nature works, regeneration, and how we humans have organized our lives, extraction. It allows us to redesign the human presence on earth, driven by human creativity, problem solving, and fierce love of this planet. In my course on environmental sociology, we talk about the need for what we call normal environmentalism. It's a matter of making the right choices for the environment, not only because those actions are good for the planet, but also because they are the easiest, the safest, and the most economical choices to make. Quote, normal environmentalism is walking or taking your bicycle to work. It's using less heating, cooling, construction materials, and water. It's replacing old appliances with energy efficient ones. It's buying food produced with sustainable production methods and where workers get a fair wage and decent working conditions. Normal environmentalism means doing things not because you've made a conscious decision to be environmentally and to behave environmentally and be environmentally just today, but because these were the cheapest, the safest, the most convenient, and the most enjoyable things to do. Normal environmentalism is being environmentally good without having to be environmentally good. But getting to that point requires new models of the social constitution of our daily lives. It requires radical regeneration. Or according to Figueres and Rivet Karnak, it requires doing what is necessary. So how do we do this? Well, in their book, which you can tell I've become a fan of, they have 10 steps. And they say there are 10 steps that we should all engage in. The first is let go of the old world. Honor the past, but let it go. Focus on where we're going, not where we've been. Number two, face your grief, but hold a vision of the future. There will be losses. Climate change is coming. Climate change is already here for many communities. We can't go back. We need to allow ourselves to grieve, but we have to be able to move beyond that point. We can't let our longing for those old ways prevent us from forging a new, more ecological future. Number three, defend the truth. Learn how to tell fact from fiction, real science from pseudoscience. Be informed. Learn how to evaluate sources and determine the legitimacy of research. Don't contribute to the spread of misinformation and do everything you can to stop the spread of misinformation. Number four, see yourself as a citizen, not as a consumer. We have to change our relationship with competition and materialism. We need to put the concept of individualism aside in order to seek connection and collaboration with others. We have to recognize what is enough and we have to honor that. 
Number five, we have to move beyond fossil fuels. This is very practical. We have to embrace change. We need to champion renewable energy sources like wind and solar. And we have to call on the government to make changes before being forced to make those changes. Number six, we have to engage in reforesting the earth. We have to invest in life. We need to pay attention to our bond with nature. We can't assume that nature is going to replenish itself without our assistance. We have to be proactive in that regeneration. Plant trees, boycott companies contributing to deforestation. Number seven, we must invest in a clean economy. Put your money where it matters. Know where your investments are going to and invest in those companies that are socially and environmentally conscientious. Number eight, use technology responsibly. Use artificial intelligence effectively, but with some reflection. Artificial intelligence can and should be an ally in our fight against climate change. Number nine, build gender equality. Empower women around the world. And number 10, engage in politics. Participate in your civic duties. Let your vote count. Make your vote matter. They end the book with a few thoughts that I wanted to share. They argue or say, we want you to know two things. First, even at this late hour, we still have a choice about our future and therefore every action we take from this moment forward counts. Second, we are capable of making the right choices about our own destiny. We are not doomed to a devastating future and humanity is not flawed and incapable of responding to big problems if we act. Future generations will most likely look back at this moment as a single most significant turning point for action. When the eyes of our children and their children look straight into ours and they ask us, what did you do? Our answer cannot just be that we did everything we could. It has to be more than that. There is really only one answer. We did everything that was necessary. I'm going to try to change my mindset. This week, my students in my Sociology of the Environment class are sharing examples of positive changes. My example was regenerative agriculture. One day, I'll own a share of the family farm that I grew up on. I hope to encourage my cousins who farm that land to use my acreage to experiment with models of regenerative and sustainable agriculture. By the time my son inherits my share, I hope the entire farm will embrace such models. I'm sure those messages of doom and gloom are going to continue to haunt me. And there will be days that I feel anxious and depressed. But I'm gonna do my best to move from a cynical vision of the present to an optimistic vision of the future. I will do that for my students and I owe that to my son. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of Focus Frost Work events and be sure to check out some of those films in the film festival that we made available to you. Thank you.